call the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting to order. Um, before we even get started here this morning, I just want to say uh, we have uh, Mr. Snyder is a new member of the board. He is not deliberating. He's just sitting in today. Uh, I guess he's dipping his toes in the water. And um, uh, Julie is sitting in. Uh, she was the alternate, and she was in on the beginning of this case. So if there's any confusion as to why there's six members sitting up here, I wanted to dispel that right from the get-go. Um, didn't have to say this during the virtual hearings. This is crazy. But if you have any electronic devices, please uh, go ahead and silence those so that it doesn't interrupt our proceedings here today. So with that, um, I guess I'll go through a couple of the uh, the procedure here today is that so this is a continuation of the case. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bowersox is representing uh, neighboring uh, neighboring landowners. Uh, Ms. Nip is here with her application. Um, and if you plan to testify here today, could you please stand and raise your right hand and take the oath? Uh, Mr. Bale, before we do the continuation hearing, could we do the two uh, um, extension requests before we oh, get I'm to the sorry. case? You can be seated. Mr. Dixon, I'm, I'm at a loss as to where they are on our agenda. Oh, here. Case 219 and or uh, 6219 and 6148. 6269 and 6254. I do not have the documentation on that. <coughs> hmm. If you just hand me the letter, I'll go ahead and read the letter. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll read the letter. Okay. Uh, BZA K 6269, to whom it may concern, I am requesting a six month extension for the site plan review process. I have reached out to a few engineers back in January as suggested by the Bureau of Development Review. And the quotes that I received for this process have been disheartening to say the least. I operate a small business and I was not expecting these additional expenses. From the start of the zoning process, I made the conscious and possibly uneducated decision to lease a commercial property to avoid disturbing my residential neighborhood. I appreciate the board's decision and the helpful employees that have aided me during this process. Furthermore, I apologize for not moving forward in this process at a faster pace. I will be starting the site plan review process myself before the end of this week and appreciate a deadline extension. Thank you, Christopher Lane, Landscapes LLC, Sykesville, Maryland, 21784 uh, for contractor's equipment storage yard. In the background on this for the board members <coughs> that sat in on this case a couple of years ago, this is where this is at Route 91 and 32, and it's the back building which the bow hunters den at one point had a archery firing range in there, if I remember correctly. So, what's the pleasure of the board? <clears throat> the request is for six months. My experience here tells me that if he has to come back. We should extend for the maximum that we can, which is a year. So I'd suggest that we do that, and he's got plenty of time. If he finishes in six months, no harm done. I agree. Okay. Any further discussion? I'm ready for a motion. I move that we grant the request uh, case number. Um, BZA case 6269. In case number 6269, to grant the extension of one year. Do I have a second? Second. second. I'm sorry, second. Okay, any discussion on the motion? <coughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. So the extension has been granted for 12 months. 
Okay, Mr. Dixon. All right, uh, another request from Van Mar Associates, Inc., Engineer Surveyors Planner, uh, June 14, 2021. Um, D. Patel to Joe <coughs> Vance. Dear Miss Vance, the owner of the site located at 7457 Watersville Road, Mount Airy, Maryland, on property zone A, Agricultural Industrial District, Election District 13, has received a notice of decision on Board of Zoning Appeals case number 6254 on December 8, 2020. The owner of the property was requested to submit us the site plan in compliance to the county code 158.132. Due to unprecedented COVID-19, employees and scheduling has been turned upside down and this deadline was inadvertently missed. We hereby request a 90-day extension to the original decision by the board. Per a conversation, a check in the amount of $225 for the extension has been dropped in the red box in the lobby. Please feel free to contact D. Patel for any further questions. So they're requesting an extension too. Many. When was the case, when was this case originally heard, Mr. Dixon? What date? Let's see, hearing held December first, twenty twenty. December 1st, 2020. Yes. Catherine Burke Howe. Request for conditional use for contractor This is, this is back along the, the stream, uh, the contractor storage yard. Hardscaping, landscaping, design, yes. LLC. How many months did they have to get a site plan submitted? Is it one year? Mr. Boyd, six months. Six months. Six months. Six months. Six months. Okay, so they slightly missed that deadline. Um, and they're asking for a 90 day? Well, this is, this is the engineer's uh, requesting this, yes. Okay, what's the pleasure of the board since it is the engineer that's requesting additional time? I think we should grant it. I'm fully sympathetic to the staffing issues and things being overlooked and overwhelmed during this time. They're asking for 90 days and I'm just wondering if we shouldn't double that. I agree. You know, they're only requesting 90, but why don't we double that and go six months? Just to suggestion. Why not? Yeah. Okay. okay, I'll entertain a motion. Please. Um, I apologize, I didn't write the case number down. 6254. Thank you. In case number 6254, I move that we grant an extension for six months for to follow the site plan. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion on the motion to extend the deadline for six months on the site plan in case number 6254? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. Motion carries. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dixon. I didn't have that on my agenda, but that's okay. And, and one last reminder. Um, so people in the building don't get in trouble. When people leave the room, if you would ask them to return their badges to the uh, officer in the front of the building because they do a check for badges when people leave. So you can't leave our, this exit right here. You've got to return your badges to the officer in the front here or they're going to search the building for those badges. <laughs> They're going to come knocking on your door. And they will look. They were going to. They're going to ask for those badges. How? Where? So you need okay, to so you, return the badges when you leave. You all have been warned. That, that, that's your legal advice from Mr. Dixon here this morning. Don't, don't, don't leave without or properly. Yeah, going through the correct door. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Okay, with that, we're back to the continuation of case number 6322. So if you plan to testify today, uh, would you go ahead and uh, please stand and take the oath? Do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Very good. Thank you. With that, um, Ms. Nip, there was additional information that was requested of you. Have you gotten that information? And, yes. And and you want to come to the you want to come to the microphone? Sure. Okay. Okay, so Ms. Smith. So you, the additional information that you were requested to, to provide to us in our decision-making process? Yes, I um, amended the application and I sent it in to Joe Vance. Okay, can you briefly tell us uh, what you amended? Um, this is Suzanne Swisher. She's actually a friend, advocate, and a puppy parent. Okay, so please, and, and please state your name, your address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Uh, my name is Suzanne Swisher, S-W-I-S-H-E-R. I reside at 1130 Algernon Drive in Westminster, 21157, and I am a registered nurse, clinical documentation specialist. Okay, Ms. Swisher. So um, with the amended application, we included um, a table of the variances, um, multiple variances. Um, we included a, a, a plat, which you may have from the previous hearing. We, um, the, we have a, z a zoning map that shows the distance variances uh, from the dwelling. There should be a first page uh, of copy of um, Ms. Snip's insurance policy, a sample of the intake form that new clients fill out. Um, you hopefully still have the letters, about 12 or so letters of um, support from neighbors and clients. And then we added um, some pictures from the, uh, the deck and showing the, uh, the lower level where the dog crates are um, inside. And then we, um, we have six previously approved BZA cases for um, conditional uses and multiple variances. If I may, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, good morning. Um, for those of you who are familiar, it's nice to see you again. For those who are new, welcome, and it's, that'll be good working with you. Um, could, could you identify yourself for the record? David Bowersox, 24 North Court Street, Westminster, Maryland, on behalf of Carla Boss. Um, I understand that um, uh, this, this new witness was introduced uh, as assisting, but one thing I would caution the board and Ms. Swisher about is that unless she is a licensed attorney, she does she cannot represent someone in a adjudicatory hearing in Maryland. She's not representing me. She's just well. Then at this point, if she's not representing her, then I would like to have her statement treated as testimony. It wasn't made clear when she started, and I would note an objection to the other conditional use cases that they've talked about. I haven't seen any of that. Uh, it's not part of the record, as far as, as I know, in, in evidence in this case. And I would say that it's not relevant to this case. So, so Ms. Swisher and Ms. Nip, 
well, Mr. Bowersox raises a very good point. Ms. Swisher, you can, you can be a witness, but you, you can't be an attorney. I understand. Um, and so, so with that, the way our proceedings work is the applicant has the opportunity to make their case, call witnesses, and then the opposing attorney uh, or interested parties can then cross-examine your testimony, not ask you questions that have nothing to do with your testimony, but of your actual testimony. And at that point, uh, then uh, Ms. Nip can call a, another uh, witness that she would like. So really, Ms. Nip, if you want to call Ms. Swisher as a witness, that, that's fine, but she cannot represent you in any capacity. Okay, and we're aware of that. Okay. Yes. Okay, is that acceptable? Uh, and, and then we have the issue then of the other cases? Well, that's, that's part of it. Um, I, I am aware of the newly submitted, or the amended application, which going way back in history to May 26th, was what the board decided they would do instead of dismissing the application outright at that time is to continue the case to allow the application to be amended. I've seen that amended application. I intend to comment on it. Um, but there has been no other evidence introduced to this board since May 26th. And what Ms. Swisher's been talking about isn't among what was introduced on the 26th. Well, with an amendment, we also added some additional <clears throat> information that was sent in in the same packet. So that's the yeah. table of, of what we Dixon, just read to you is everything file? that got submitted. Yes. So it is in the file. Yes. It's not evidence. If I'm going so, to cross-examine the evidence, I have to have an opportunity to know what it is and have it presented and have it accepted as relevant by this board. I'm, being I'm, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but to proceed this way is going to deprive my client of a right to cross-examine. Okay. So, Mr. Dixon, at this point, uh, you've, you've introduced the file at our last meeting. Could you go ahead and introduce the additional information that was requested of Ms. Nip? Would that satisfy that, Mr. Bowersox? Ordinarily, Proceed, really? if they're introducing this as evidence for you to consider, it needs to be put into the record. Of okay, the so Mr. Dixon, could you go ahead and uh, int introduce the additional information from the file? And excuse me, by clarification, an application is an application. That's part of your administrative record. The other material, which is not part of that application <clears throat> and is intended to support, is evidence, and it needs to be dealt with as evidence. That's what I'm getting. Yeah. All right, this looks like uh, new information. and. Uh, uh, house number 7571, distance in feet from 7578, um, 220.1 feet. Uh, house number 7575, distance in feet from 7578, uh, 174.6. Uh, house number 7452, uh, distance in feet from 7578, 134.7. House number mm, 7452, distance in feet from 7578. Um, let's see, 74. House number 7447, distance in feet from 7578. 194.6. One three two point one house number seven four five five distance in feet from seven five seven eight uh, one three two point one house number seven five zero five distance in feet from seven five seven eight one one zero point eight house number seven five one one distance in feet from seven five seven eight one one four point four house number seven five one seven distance in feet from seven five seven eight one seven eight point eight 
House number one, one, 7518, distance in feet from 7578186.2. House number 7514, distance in feet from 7578186.2. House number 7514, distance in feet from 7578186.2. House number 7514, distance in feet from 7578186.2. Three nine point zero, house number seven five seven zero, distance and feet from seven five seven eight one five four point zero. Mr. Dixon, is that found after page two of the amended complaint? Uh, let's see. Uh, Page two, yes. This okay. Is the next page after the amendment. I have seen that list. I've also seen the I've seen the amended application. Uh, page one and page two. So, Mr. Barris, actually, my question is. Do you accept that as being part of the application, or do you feel that that is evidence and needs to be moved into evidence? I, I don't think it's part of the application per se, except possibly as an intention to explain the variance request found in the second explanation block on page two of that amended complaint. That's, so so, so I, I can accept it as that. Would I? heard was a number of other correspondences and a list of conditional uses in the neighborhood that this board had approved, which I did not see in the copy of the amended complaint which I obtained. So you're satisfied with what Mr. Dixon that, sure. read is and part I of intend, the application? I intend to go into that in some detail. So that doesn't need to be entered into evidence that is? That I'll accept it as part of the application. You accept? Okay, very good. So if any additional information is presented, uh, Ms. Nip, it needs to be moved into evidence. So it needs to be, a copy needs to be given to Mr. Dixon. He will label that and put it in the file. Okay? So, we, so we're good, we're good, Mr. Barisox? As far as that's concerned, I don't know if there's other material in there. I would, I would rephrase my objection that any object in the other conditional uses have been approved in the neighborhood or any yeah, other things. I, I don't object to that and ask that that be stricken because we don't know what they were about. We don't know when they were. We don't know what the ordinance said at the time. Um, and there's been no support for it. Now, there are other BZA decisions, but it doesn't even have the whole decision. I mean, there's the case 5967. It's the first page. It doesn't even have the whole decision. It's got the first page of the decision. I don't even know what the outcome of the decision was. It's got case 5967. It's got case 6077, the first page, not the whole decision. I don't know what the conclusion was. It's got case 5956, first page of the decision. It's got case 5573, first page. Not the whole decision. Don't know what the conclusion was. And case 6310, first page of the decision, not the whole decision. Case 6287. And these, let me see, what the, uh, it was a con commercial kennel. One is a dog kennel. Maybe they're kennel cases, but then it's commercial, they're kennel cases, but then they, I don't know what uh, the outcome of the case was. They're kennel cases, but I don't know what the outcome of the kennel case was. So, for what it's worth, they asked, maybe these are kennel cases, but don't know what the outcome of the case was. Some are in ag, di uh, ag district, some are in, let's see, ag district, ag district, ag, Ag, conservation. So, I'm not really sure what the, these cases what they're what they're getting at. 
Mr. Dixon, um, can we ask you for legal advice how to go forward with those? Number one, they're incomplete decisions. We don't know. We don't. Or they're. The, we don't know the decision. We don't know the decision. I don't we know. Have I don't cases know. We I don't, don't know what they're supposed to help the board. What what the point is with those cases? <laughs> Mr. Bell, I have a question just for clarification because I think I misunderstood. Um, I, it was my understanding that when we did a continuance of this, it was to permit the application to be corrected and resubmitted. I didn't realize we were hearing new evidence today. Is that, did I misunderstand the procedure? Well, you can always hear new evidence. The case wasn't completed, so you can hear new witnesses, new evidence. Yes, we, we can always hear new evidence. The case wasn't completed. Thank you. To the extent that this, these have been uh, they haven't even been offered uh, formally, in my opinion. But to the extent that they're being asserted by implication as being supportive of the request that's before you because you've done it before, I, I think that for, to that extent, it's a prejudicial offer, and I would ask you to, um, I object to it and ask that you not accept it as evidence. Ms. Nip, would you like to respond to, because I'm not sure how we handle this. We have a case without a decision, and I'm not sure how that is in any way going to help or hinder your case here today. Well, it was just to uh, prove that similar situations, which some of those were actually approved. So it was actually just to show you that we had very similar, uh, you ruled on uh, very similar cases that we have that we're going into today and they were they were ruled in favor of the dog boarding and daycare. Another question. Uh -huh. I, you, you indicated that some of those were actually approved. Does that not mean that everything in that file was approved? Mm -hmm. They all six were, yes, I'm sorry. We've looked at a bunch of them, so yeah, we have provided the six that are approved. Thank you. Yes. I mean, I'm willing to take administrative, I'm willing to acknowledge um, that this board has approved kennels in the past. Some in cases I've been involved in, some in cases I've been advocating for the kennel, and some in cases I've been advocating against. So I'm aware that this board has done that in other cases in the past. These conditional use cases are to be decided on the particular facts of each case that is presented in determining the Schultz versus Pritz and Loyola College case standards for conditional uses based on the particulars of where the request is located and the potential impacts that are generated by it. There's a larger question of the variance. We have no idea whether any of those variants, uh, any of those other cases required variances. Uh, if so, what variances? how much, um, the nature of the neighborhood. And so for that reason, I'm not trying to pick. I'm truly not trying to pick. Uh, I'm, I just, for the sake of protecting the record and protecting my client, I object to it. And, and Mr. Bower Sox, I would hope that this board does, uh, you would perceive that this board does uh, act independently on each case. Right. Uh, and and th that is what we're charged to do. And, and I, I would hope that we continue to do that. Yes. Okay. Okay, Ms. Nip. So, with your uh, additional information, um, did you, as far as the uh, the distances to the surrounding homes, do you have anything to add to that? Because that seems to be the new information that was uh, requested of you and that you supplied. Yeah, actually, we we found some information that um, well. You actually have it here, so I, I'm just going to call Suzanne as a witness because um, she's got some information that actually disputes what Mr. Bauer Sox had said in the first meeting. So I'm just going to. Okay, so um, Ms. Swisher, you're then you're going to go ahead and be a witness for Ms. Nip. Yes. Okay, you can proceed. Thank you. Did you want to share the picture? I can do that. Would you like me to submit into evidence what we? You said so, it had to be in yes. now. I think at four, yes. at four points we do have evidence to submit. So how would you like us to handle that? Well, well, go, go ahead and talk talk about the evidence. Uh, talk about the the um, um, documents that you want to enter into evidence. 
show them to Mr. Bowersox, and then give them to Mr. Dixon, and at that point he'll label it and we'll enter those into evidence. Okay, I will need a couple of them back if I'm asked to read them. Um, unfortunately, I only have one copy. Well, you, you can keep those until the testimony okay. is over. Okay, very good, thank okay. you. <clears throat> thank you for your time this morning. Um, as a home-based business, Ms. Sniff seeks, seeks to provide daily care for household dogs while their owners work and intermittent boarding services when her clients travel. No more than six additional dogs at any given time. Operating hours for daycare clients would be 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The dogs are cared for in a cage-free, fun, safe, nurturing, social, family home setting and are supervised 100% of the time, indoors and out. Overnight boarders sleep in appropriately sized dog crates in a finished area of the lower level. A portion of the yard is fenced. Miss Nip has a lifetime of experience with dogs, rescue, therapy, service, and personal. The Nips personally own four dogs, two of which are registered service dogs. Her elderly Yorkies uh, is a retired dental working therapy dog. Her resume includes managing a successful dental practice, fostering for a dog rescue organization, and providing dog walking services. The applicant is seeking permission to provide daycare and boarding services for up to six additional dogs on a variable schedule to accommodate her client's needs. This is a much needed, highly respected, and appreciated service in the local community. Woodbine Wolfpack has quickly grown a cohort of loyal clients, has a waiting list, and has many positive public reviews. Traffic disruption is negligible since the NIP property is the first driveway on the left of John Pickett Road off Woodbine Road and she deliberately staggers the arrival and departure time to ensure individual and unhurried drop-offs with time for instruction. As clients pull up, Miss Nip takes custody of the dog directly from the car and returns them to their owners in the same fashion at the end of the day. The driveway abuts a double garage and is ADA accessible. The dogs and their owners are temperament tested and provided an orientation of the home prior to consideration for acceptance. An extensive vetting process includes a comprehensive intake form, up-to-date vaccination records and licensure, and a vet's certificate, certification of good health prior to admission into the daycare. And you actually have one of the new, uh, the evidence that was provided is my intake form, so you can actually see that. Uh, I'm <laughs> Mr. Byersox, would you like to ask questions of her testimony? Well, I'm, tr I'm trying to how do I say this, be cooperative. Um, it, it appears she's reading from the statement. I'm going to withhold my objections until the conclusion of that. I have never seen an intake document. Um, I, I, I do not know what they have put into the administrative file in advance of today's hearing since May 26, but if they intended to become Mr. Evidence, Barisox, and I, I totally understand that, but as as the, the opposition attorney, you have the opportunity to go ahead and ask questions about that. So you can ask that of her testimony. Well, what I'm saying is the intake sheet is being offered as evidence. I haven't had an opportunity to I'll test it. I'll be happy that. to give you a copy of it. Yeah. And any other documentation that we placed into the file? And um, I'll provide uh, my insurance, liability insurance as well. statement. I'm going to withhold my objections to your I do need to trip you up. Ms. <coughs> Nib does, uh, Ms. Nip does not approve or retain aggressive, destructive, sick dogs or dogs that vocalize unreasonably. Ms. Nip's business is insured. Under her care, the dogs are on a structured daily schedule for indoor and outdoor playtime activities, eating, toileting, and sleeping. The day is organized much like a children's preschool schedule. 
When outside in the fenced area, they generally stay close to the house unless fetching a toy or playing with one another. She, she shares photos and videos with the dog's owners throughout the day. I would caution against a disproportionate weight on the term commercial. Please note that the definition of commercial kennel in the zoning ordinance does not specify a minimum or maximum number of dogs. This discreetly run doggy daycare in the ag zone is home based with minimal traffic, negligible commerce, offering services from approximately 7A to 7P. It involves no breeding, buying, letting for hire, training services, or sales. There are no hospital services. There is one part-time 12-year-old volunteer helper. The planning department noted that the proposed use would not have a major impact on traffic and was consistent with the zoning classification under section 158.070. In fact, this home-based business is much less disruptive to the surrounding community than a home daycare with eight to 12 children, which is a principal permitted use in the ag zone and a conditional use subject to zoning administrator approval after a public hearing in all residential zones. The doggy daycare does not add residential development and creates no change to the existing density in the area. We submit that conducting a doggy daycare at this location as described and with the overwhelmingly strong support of surrounding residents and clients and indispensable service to the community is without detriment to the neighborhood and does not adversely affect the public interest. Indeed, it serves the community and is highly valued by its members. Since there is no probative evidence of harm or disturbance in light of the nature of the zone involved or of factors causing disharmony to the operation of the comprehensive plan, we propose that Woodbine Wolfpack doggy daycare and boarding passes the Schultz birth prints test. The zoning office provided uh, six similarly approved BZA cases, the first pages of which are included in Ms. Snip's application. There are likely many more than six. The most comparable case, number 5967, is a conditional request for a doggy daycare and multiple variances to adjoining properties. The subject property is on 1.39 acres in the subdivision of Taylor Field Acres. The Bureau of Comprehensive Planning found it was not inconsistent with the Carroll County Master Plan. The BZA agreed and the request met the purpose of the zoning ordinance and would not generate any adverse effects on the surrounding community. Uh, um, Mr. Bowersox? I'm going to object to that. On, on what grounds? Another conditional use case <laughs> in another location. Yeah. And, and, and Ms. Wisher? I want to try to be as fair as I can. I would just we need base to these on their own merits, not on other, not on other approvals. So, I understand. So I, did, I just want to caution you that 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 has that should not have any bearing in our decision. Uh, other cases, we we look at the merits of every case, the setbacks, uh, the impact on the community, uh, the variances that, that are required uh, in, in each case. So each one is very different. The the number of dog cases that I've heard over the years, I can't say that any two of them were anywhere close to being the same. So. I just want to just want to say that. So go ahead, Miss Swisher. Since Miss Snip is a newcomer to the county, we appreciate the board's hospitality in providing more time for her to amend her application. Miss Snip reached out appropriately to the zoning administrator's office for help with filing her application, and as previously testified, contacted the health department. She became insured and conscientiously followed all instructions she was given. In part one of this hearing on May 26th, Mr. Bowersox recommended that the board dismiss and deny Ms. Snit's request because the variance portion of the application was incomplete. Section 158.133D4 states from the ordinance, upon receipt of an application or appeal made or filed pursuant to D1, the zoning administrator shall review the application or appeal for completeness and shall reject, reject those applications which are not complete. And then the cover page of the application packet says incomplete applications shall be rejected as required by the Code of Public Laws and Ordinances, section 223-188. This implies that the application should have been returned to Ms. Nib for amendments prior to processing for the original hearing on May 26th 
and prior to the planning department's analysis. During part one of the case, there was very considerable emph emphasis placed on the northwest corner of the NIPS fence, not meeting the distance or setback requirements to the boss's lot. According to 158.060 of the county code, measurement of separation or distance between uses, it is not required to. Clearly, the fence is an integral, essential, and necessary part of the composite whole of the business operation. It is also integral to the safety of the NIPS grandchildren and other guests when they visit, and integral in providing security from trespassers or vandals. It is not the structure of the kennel. The measurement from the corner of the NIPS fence to the corner of the boss's lot is not the correct standard to be used in this case. According to section 158.060 of the county code, measurement of separation or distance between uses states, when measuring a required separation between uses, distance shall be determined from the nearest point of the structure occupied by the use, requiring separation to the nearest point of the boundary of the lot from which the separation is to be established. The Zoning Administrator's Office provided measurements as a supplement to the amended application, which should be before the board, clearly demonstrating the proper taking of the measurements, that being the shortest distance from the structure of the NIP dwelling to the nearest point of neighboring boundaries. The measurements show that a distance variance to the boss's property is not required because it is greater than 200 feet away. And I would like to uh, submit, enter into evidence, <coughs> exhibit that I will call number two. We'll let Mr. Dixon go ahead and, and label those. Okay, and do I pass them to yes, Mr. Bounds first? Thank you. And this is the first page of the boss's deed, which. Explain to them before you would offer that to be admitted what the second page is. It is a zoning map um, measuring the distance between the dwelling of the NIP slot and, um, and the corner of the boss's property. I have no objection to that coming in as evidence. I just wanted it to be clear what it was. Um, I believe that's possibly applicant's exhibit one. I think so. Yeah. Would you? Um, so I, I'm not going to object to it. I'm, I, I, that doesn't mean I, I am not going to question it or use it in cross examination. Would you like this, Mr. Dixon? Yes. And then there, are there additional documents there you want to enter into evidence that Mr. Bowersock yeah, has? about and you already have that one which is the intake form in your file and insurance the, the thing that has 217.1 feet that's going to be exhibit one yes what about this the first photos, page? The photos, the photos, the photos. Oh, exhibit two is going to be book 1247, page 365. Mr. Barasak's exhibit two was going to be book 12. It's not my exhibit. Oh, Mr. Barasak. <laughs> All right, exhibit one is going to be. Enough. <clears throat> Exhibit one will be, uh, it's 217.1 feet. All right, that, that's Exhibit one. And I don't know what these other things are. You just hand it's, it to It's me. just uh, Exhibit just showing the daily operations. It uh, shows how the kennel is set up, the dog daycare, and some pictures. I'm going to object. Unless, or I, and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to pick. I'm just trying to protect the record. Unless, or 
somebody has to explain identify these things are. And in, in, in order for them to be offered as evidence, they have it has to be explained to the board. Okay, sure. Okay, First one shows the indoor area of the kennels, one of the play areas, and rainy day indoor grass play areas. So we don't always have to be outside. All right, could you write exhibit one at the bottom of that okay. so I could put, put that? Uh, mm -hmm. What is exhibit one? two? Exhibit two. Exhibit I two. thought two was the first page of the deed. <laughs> no, that's exhibit. So put exhibit two on that, and then I'll put okay. the. So what is exhibit one? Exhibit one is, is the map. map. Yeah. It's the thing that had 217. Okay. That's exhibit one. What's exhibit two? This picture. That picture. Do we agree? That's okay. exhibit okay. two. I'll put what it. is exhibit three? She's going to write down exhibit three, and I'm going to put the sticker on it. Okay. So what is exhibit two? This picture. It's a photograph. Of of that. Indoor. So two and three are two photographs. Yes. We have multiple. Are we not going to? I'm just trying to. I gotta make a scorecard so I can keep driving. She's gonna write it down and I'm gonna put a sticker on it when I get it. First page of the boss's deed. I'm sorry? First page of the boss's deed. That's this. We haven't gotten that. Okay. She's gonna write and I'm gonna put the sticker on. What, what okay. number do we want this one? Because okay. this, this actually goes with the map showing the distance from the NIF dwelling. The first page of the deed explains where to start. Measurement. I understand, okay. but we're gonna we're gonna read we're gonna read okay. through the. Okay. All right. This next picture is the entrance to this area, the dog area, um, and it's taking a picture from the doorway where you can not really see or very slightly see the boss's property. The next picture is one of the neighbors up the street coming to get her little puppy fix on and visiting the dogs that we have. The next picture are the dogs laying nicely and quietly in the yard, relaxing, all sleeping. The next picture is the UPS man who likes to give the dogs treats when he comes up. And you're putting the number on these next picture. When she says next picture, you're putting numbers on these pictures? I am. Is that okay? Okay. That, that's what I want. Okay. The next when you, the when next you finish with all those pictures, show all those pictures to Mr. Bowersox. Thank you. This next picture is my grandson in another indoor area. And this is rest time. This is winding down for the night. And the last picture, we have a little competition between the UPS man and the mail lady. And... This is what our front looks like, and we get boxes with dog treats on them. So it's a, a little fun neighborhood. So that's it, just some, some fun pictures for our business. Now, if you want to include that in front of your desk, you want that number, put, put a number on that and show it to Mr. Bowersox so, so he'll have all the documents. And if you want to include this intake form, uh, it, put a number on that and give that to Mr. Bowersox. Well, you already have that, so unless he wants it. Do you want it, Mr. Bowersox? If you want to include that in the record, you need to put a number on it and give it to Mr. Bowersox. Let's just put it on that. Okay. Okay.
want to introduce into evidence to bring them to Mr. Dixon? What do we have? One through, yeah. one through ten. So applicants that exhibit one through ten will accept those into evidence, without objection. Um, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm offering no objection. It doesn't mean that I'm joining in their introduction or that I'm not going to question. Okay. Very good. Okay, Mr. Bowersox, do you have questions of Ms. Swisher's testimony? I do. I do. Good morning, Ms. Swisher. We're not done. I was not finished. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Swisher. Thank you. I, I, thought, I thought you were. I'm sorry. No. Um, Mr. Bowersox testified on the, during the May 26th hearing that he represented the bosses who reside across the street at 7571 John Pickett and that the corner of their lots abut the corner of the subject site. I was having a difficult time visualizing this since the boss's property is across the street and two lots down. The boss's residence is not even visible from the NIP's back deck, nor is the NIP dwelling visible from the front of the boss's home, according to the image that was uh, entered into evidence at the previous hearing. Looking closer at the zoning map, it would appear to the naked eye that they do not meet. If we were to compare the two deeds side by side and measure the distance of Miss Nip's lot from the starting point at the intersection of Woodbine Road and John Pickett West to the distance of 289.06 feet according to the deed and measure Miss Balls' property line 100 feet from the southwest corner of her lot on John Pickett headed east, we would discover a gap measuring approximately 16 feet, indicating, indicating that the properties fall short of one another and do not adjoin. And I would like to submit into evidence those measurements that I just described. You have copies of the deeds, and it shows the starting point from the NIPS property at the intersection of Woodbine and John Pickett. And then um, this would be entered in as evidence number 11? Yes. Collectively is 11 or? Uh, collectively is 11. And this. I can voir dire this. Mrs. Swisher, where do you obtain these maps? The Cal County uh, website, zoning okay. maps. Okay. You did not commission a survey for these? No. Okay. Acknowledging that the boss lot is across John Pickett Road, are you aware that these zoning maps are based on boundary lines shown on tax maps? Shown on tax maps. Mm -hmm. And you're aware the tax maps are somewhat notoriously inaccurate in terms mm -hmm. of locating. Mm -hmm. Give or take. No objection. enter these documents into evidence as applicants number 11. Okay. 11 and 12, I believe, wasn't it? Is it 11 and 12, Mr. Dixon, or collectively is 11? Well, she said just 11. Collectively is 11. Please let me know when I may continue. 
I'm sorry. I, Please let me know when I may continue. I didn't know. If you, you can go ahead and continue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Niff did, stated that she did not realize there was an issue with zoning <coughs> until the zoning administrator's letter appeared in her mailbox. Upon ultimately discovering the identity of the anonymous neighborhood tipper, and in an effort to reconcile with her neighbor outside of court, Ms. Nip sent a personal letter to Mrs. Carla Boss, which was hand-delivered personally to Ms. Boss by their mutual mail carrier. And we have the letter here. Ms. Nip would like to read it, if that's okay. Okay. This is, this is her own letter. Correct, I personally okay. wrote it to her and placed it in the mailbox. I, I mailed it for the, or the United Parcel Service to deliver to her. Hi Carla, I know we got off on the wrong foot as neighbors by me not notifying you of the dog daycare and boarding business. I apologize that and certainly do, I apologize for that and certainly do not want to upset you. Had I have known or been given the proper information in the case, in the first case, then I would have taken the appropriate measures in zoning approval. I really wish you had just come up and had a conversation with me and all of this could have been avoided. I spoke with all my immediate neighbors and received their approval upon starting and would have done the same with you. I know that you are aware of how meaningful this business is to me, my neighbors, and the community. I would really like to see if we could work something out and call a truce by coming up with a mutual agreement to satisfy both parties. I will have my attorney at the next meeting, which I thought I was going to have, so I apologize for that, um, in June, which would cost us both a lot of unnecessary money. To show my good faith, I removed my fence sign because I know this was one of your concerns. I also am assuring you that I will not have more than 10 dogs at once, including them, uh, nor will I use my detached garage in any way for the animals. I am a responsible person, and I hope you are too. Since we know some of the same people in the community and we are neighbors, I hope that you will reach out to me before the next hearing. Sincerely, Regina Nip, with my cell phone number and my email address. And I have not heard from Ms. Boss. And uh, we should, do you need to see a copy of this? Do you, do you want to enter that into evidence? Should, yes. This will be number 12. 12. Accept that into evidence. No objection. Okay, Ms. Swisher, you can continue. Yes, please. Thank you. This should be the last uh, piece of evidence to enter, and this is a picture of the tax map. And it's the neighbors that wrote letters of support are indicated by stars on the text map. And this would be number 13. And the question, these letters are already in the file? Yes, they were submitted the first go around. Correct. They're gold stars. Mm -hmm. I'm going to object. The letters are already in the file. I went through with Mr. Dixon at the conclusion of the May 26th theory to verify certain addresses of those who had sent letters in. The visual representation to me seems as much like a petition as anything. It's surplus to what you already have. As this board knows, zoning is not a plebiscite uh, and I would object to the receipt of it. I'm not going to go through any histrionics. I'm just I don't think it's necessary with what's in the work. The reason we're doing this is so that you can see that each neighbor that adjoins my property has written a letter in support. And Ms. Boss does not adjoin my property, and she's the only one that's objected to it. So that is the reason for this. Everybody uh, I'll, I'll, allow, I'll allow that to be moved into evidence. Thank you. 
it, it supports what's already there in, in, in the file. So Mr. Dixon, what are we up to now? 13. 13. So we'll accept that into evidence. Okay, Ms. Swisher. Here we have all the truly adjoining neighbors actively in support of or giving the green light by not opposing Ms. Nip's home business. And the one neighbor in dispute is ironically the furthest distance away at 217 feet. 17 feet more than I'm gonna object. Department. I'm gonna object. This sounds like advocacy and not testimony at this point. And I'm sorry, I'm, the, I'm the, trying the, to be polite, I there, really am. The, 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 the language, could you amend that language, Ms. Swisher? Yes. In that statement. The tax map and the supporting letters show that there is support from the surrounding neighbors. And the opposing neighbor is the furthest one away at 217 feet, exceeding the distance requirement and not adjoining, according to the tax maps and public record. For the record, I'll note a continuing objection to Mrs. Swisher's comments that are not representations of fact. I don't want to continue to interrupt. But it, and, I, and, I, and you have that opportunity in your questioning, Mr. Bauer Stocks, to bring that out. Okay? Okay, Ms. Swisher? I'm finished. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Bauer Socks. Thank you. Questions of Ms. Swisher's testimony. Ms. Swisher, um, good morning. What is the source of your information in the statement that you read? Which part of the statement? The, the whole the thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Carroll County government website, the zoning maps that are available, the tool, the measuring tool to um, measure distances. Okay, let me, let me rephrase it, because I'm not trying to run you down a dark path here. Um, you testified initially that this is a use offering daily care, no more than six more dogs. What's the source of your information? Ms. Nip has previously testified that she owns four. So there's nothing new in that? No. Okay. I, I, these are, I, I mean this, these are not trick questions. You said there's a fenced in yard. Um, What's the source of your information about that? Pictures okay. that you share, shared at the last hearing, as well as the diagram that Ms. Smith provided. Okay, the, the varying schedule of uh, interaction with the uh, dogs mm -hmm. or customers, I'll call them, at the NIPS, uh, NIPS facility. What's your source of knowledge about that? Ms. Nip. Okay. Testimony. So, and, and I'm a client, sorry. Pardon me? I'm also a client. Okay. No sick or aggressive dogs. Same source of information. Uh, is that correct? Correct. Do you, where do you live in relation to the facility? Uh, seven miles away. Okay, so, so I'm, I don't need to ask, you can't see it from your house. You testified no hospital services, source of that information? Ms. Nip. Indoor and outdoor facilities, is that something you've seen yourself? Yes, I'm a client. Is the outdoor facility generally within the confines of the dashed line on the map that was prepared by Mrs. Nip and introduced as evidence before as, if I can find it, Exhibit one? Yes. Opponents exhibit one. Okay. That seems accurate based on your yes. personal. All right. And the, you say the zoning office provided you the information about other cases. What was the nature of that 
uh, was was that pursuant to an inquiry from you? Yes. I Who's said, saying yes? Yes, I requested. Yes. Okay. And I provided. It. And how did you request the information? By email. What was the nature of your request? So that I could research and watch videos of past cases and be prepared for today. And, and what did you ask in your email? I can't remember exactly, just if you could, um, you know, if you had any reference for me to look at so that I could prepare myself. All right. And they, and gave, they are public records. And so they gave you a roster of cases yes. that you might be interested in? Correct. And okay. Watch them. Yes, sir. And were there more than just the six that you uh, had spoke about earlier? Yes. Okay. But you picked those six? Correct. And who, uh, I'm, I'm not even going to ask. Um, you say that you believe the application should have been returned if there was, in fact, other uh, variances that needed to be requested. Is that correct? The zoning code states that incomplete applications should be returned to the applicant for amending. Okay. But, so you took that to mean that um, the zoning administrator's mm -hmm. office is to pardon, assist you in having a complete application? Yes. Now, yeah, I, I actually did ask for assistance in helping to fill it out because it's not my expertise. So, okay. Some of the questions were unclear to me. You also talked about um, not needing to have the distance measured from anywhere but the home. Is that correct? The NIP residence? Okay, I'm going to show you So uh, this is what I had to... Okay, uh, just for the record. Yeah. Ms. Swisher is testifying. It's not a joint testimony. Oh, okay. Only I'm one sorry. person okay. can testify at a time. Okay. This is uh, the BZA application. The first block is um, a request for conditional use as a commercial kennel to operate as an in-home doggy daycare and intermittent boarding service for up to 10 dogs. The second block is the uh, multiple distance variances. And um, due to neighboring lot sizes of less than three acres in the Ag District. And the second page is a table of the surrounding. The second page addresses. is a table that Mr. Dixon read into the record previously, okay. isn't it? Save some time. Um, let's look at the condition. Well, let's go to something else right now. If you could. Take a look. At what was introduced in May as Exhibit 4, Opponent's Exhibit 4. Hmm. 
Can you tell me if you recognize that? Yes, Ms. Wisher, you're the witness. I, I saw this, um, I did not see this personally. I saw a, an image of it on um, an email. So do you know what that is? Yes, it's the first application. Okay, it's page two of the first application. And this was some of the language that we talked about needing to be amended at the end of the hearing in May, is that correct? So, in, so let's look at the conditional use first. In proposed exhibit seven that I've given you, which was your amended application, how does the conditional use request differ from the original conditional use request in exhibit four, opponents of exhibit four? It differs by uh, the second application states what will not be happening. No grooming, training, breeding, selling, outdoor kennel runs, or other similar structure. Okay. And are there any other differences? Uh, Ms. Smith had added a you know, additional comment on her first application, stating that they are never left outside alone, always supervised, kept in crates at night, only in the finished basement, 10 dogs or less, fenced yard. Read the first sentence and second sentence on the original page two of the application on exhibit four. The second sentence, they are never left outside alone. How about I read it for you and tell me if, if this is what you're saying. Conditional use for dog daycare and boarding, home and yard used to board and play with pups. Is that part of the conditional use statement seen on the amended application? Exhibit seven? No. Why, did you prepare this? We worked together. Why did you delete that language? To make it more concise. And you've testified that you yourself have seen the dogs outside, is that correct? Yes. You offered photographs showing the dogs playing outside um, at various times of day, correct? Miss Regina did. Well, you offered those photographs through your testimony. Am I right? She provided them, but yes, if they were part of my testimony. Okay. And you indicated in your testimony that this use involves structured indoor and outdoor activities for the uh, client dogs on a daily basis. Is that correct? Yes. So why delete the reference to the yard? Is there another outdoor space besides the yard where those activities take place? No. So the confines of that outdoor activity is still the fenced-in yard that we talked about on, March, on May 26th, correct? And the detached garage is where these animals are dropped off in, in the morning and picked up? That's incorrect. Okay. Where, where are they dropped off and picked up? There is a gate at okay. the fence close to the garage. Oh, but the they come in the, the driveway garage. by yes. the garage. Yes. Okay. Mr. Barsox, could I interrupt you for a second? You may. Let, let's go ahead and take about a five minute break right now. Okay, that's we'll, fine. And, and we'll, we'll come back. Right. I'll come back at uh, 1055.
Okay, Mr. Bowersock. Thank you. Um, before I get back to what I was doing, Mrs. Swisher, um, the exhibit number 12, the letter to Ms. Boss from Ms. Nip, you, you don't have any particular knowledge about how that was written or anything, just that, that it happened? No, I was aware when it took place and um, Ms. Reg uh, Regina Nip shared it with me prior to sending it. And okay. Okay. Um, if I may, Mr. Um, Dixon, I've placed the Exhibit 7 marked for identification uh, to your seat uh, during the break, and I'd move it into evidence Okay. before I forget it. Okay, we'll, we will accept that into evidence. Now, when, we, when the board broke, we were talking about the outdoor, outdoor areas and the amendments to the um, application. You had mentioned that the distances asserted in the new application on Exhibit 7, the second page, were based on Section 158.060 of the code, is that correct? Um, 158.060 is the county code for measurement of separation or distance between uses. Do you have a copy of that with you? Um, I have a cut and pasted copy, I don't have an original. All right, do you have the third sentence of section 158.060 before you? No. Do you mm -hmm. I, I only have the electronic version on my phone, I'm sorry, but if you'll bear with me, I'll read it. Let me, let me first, in fairness, go through the first sentence, which is, I believe, what you were talking about. When measuring a required separation between uses, distance shall be determined from the nearest point of the structure occupied by the use, requiring separation to the nearest point of the boundary of the lot from which the separation is to be established. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Did you review the third sentence of that code provision? Yes. And that says, in the case of an outdoor principal or accessory use requiring separation from another use, distance shall be measured from the nearest point of the outdoor use to the nearest point of the boundary from the lot, of the lot, excuse me, from which the separation is to be established. Does that sound, does that basically sound like what you're reading there? Basically. Okay. So we, we've established through your testimony and the testimony previously that part of the operation uh, is outdoor activities, structured outdoor activities within the fenced in yard. So my question to you is why did you again elect not to measure the distance for minimum distance requirements? from the outdoor use? Because the code states that it should be measured from the nearest point of the structure. What do you think the third sentence means? Well, I don't have the specific code right in front of me, so I don't recall the third sentence. All right, the third sentence says, in case of an outdoor, outdoor, principal or accessory use, requiring separation from another use. Distance shall be measured from the nearest point of the outdoor use to the nearest point of the boundary of the lot from which the separation is to be established. Now, hearing that, are you reminded that that's what the third sentence of section 158.060 of the zoning ordinance says? I am reminded. 
So why would you not, for the outdoor aspect of this use, measure it from the nearest point of the outdoor use to the nearest point of the boundary of the lot from which the separation is to be established, as the language of the code provides? Because the first sentence uses the term structure occupied by the use, and the house is the structure occupied by the daycare and boarding service. But you've, you've also indicated, again, structured daily activities, indoor and outdoor. And we've got a bunch of photos and evidence of outdoor activity. Dare say we have more of those than the indoor activity. Correct? That's wonderful, yes. Well, Happy dogs. All right, so you live seven miles away. You say the traffic disruption is negligible in your testimony, correct? Yes. All right, and you're not a, uh, uh, and I'm not trying to be flat, but you're not a traffic engineer or a traffic expert? No, however, the um, Planning Commission is, and they noted that in their comments. Okay. So how often do you have to observe the site during the day? Um, I am there once or twice a week, twice a day each time for drop-off and pick-up, okay. and, um, and my dog has boarded there. So this is your layperson's opinion based on those isolated opportunities during the week you have to observe. Well, we're also friends. I go over socially. Okay, but, but, but this wasn't the result of a study or anything that you undertook. Was what? The traffic? The traffic disruption testimony that you gave. Um, there was, uh, that was the comments submitted to the BZA uh, through Hannah Weber. Okay, so you were referring to Ms. Weber's documents? Yes. Okay. Indulgence, please. Were you aware that Mrs. Nib actually started operating in February two thousand twenty one? mentioned in her first uh, testimony. Do you know when the letter that you introduced as Exhibit 12 was mailed? You, you said it was hand delivered, and Mrs. Nip said it was mailed. Do you know when that was mailed? I don't recall the date off the top okay. of my head, but Mrs. Nip has it right no, here. No, that's there. Is it dated? My understanding is that it was hand delivered by the mail carrier because a package was also handed to Miss Nip or to Miss Boss at the same time as the letter. And the letter's dated at all. Oh, you have it. Okay. Let, let's move on from that. Um, I don't think I have any further questions for Mrs. Uh, Ms. Swisher. Thank you very much. Okay, board members, questions of Ms. Swisher. 
Mr. Caldwell, any questions? Go ahead, ask, ask, ask the question. Uh, you the had uh, provided into evidence a, a, a part of the deed that specified the meets and bounds uh, dimensions of the, uh, I think, Mrs. Voss's lot. That's correct. Um, can I ask uh, Mrs. Voss if that uh, uh, was ever surveyed recently by a professional surveyor licensed? to verify that the lot was exactly as stated in the meets and bounds? I, I'll let her answer. You may answer this my question property, if you can. My property has not been sur surveyed to my knowledge. Do you, we have, have do you have an original survey of when you bought the property we that was done by a licensed surveyor? We bought it 33 years ago, so I'm sure I do somewhere, but... Because they are subject to errors, so... My, my, the point of my question was, I have a concern that the measurement may not be precise to the corner of the lot. Uh, this was not a subdivision lot. This lot was, I believe, an existing lot. Um, I'm speculating that there is as good a chance as not that when the bosses bought their property 30 some years ago, they didn't have it surveyed at that time, except for possibly 30 years ago, 30 some years ago, the bank lending could have required a location survey, which is not the same as the boundaries. Correct, yeah, so the only one that's valid is actually one that's done by a licensed surveyor. So well, for fences for and other purposes. Yes. And, yeah. So my concern is the, the distance measurement therefore is in question. We don't know how accurate it is. How, how accurate what is? The distance between the structure or the fence and the corner of Mrs. Boss's lot. We don't know exactly what that is. Right. I mean, you can't unless you have a surveyor out there. Right. That's my point. Not precisely. But that's the applicant's burden. That's not Mrs. Boss's burden. Right. I was just trying to find out if Mrs. Boss had ever had a professional survey done. Apparently not. So. The distance then is the question. We don't know precisely. Well, Mrs. Nip acknowledged during the March 26th proceedings that the distance from the corner of the boss lot to the fence was certainly less than 200 feet. Okay. I have no further questions. Ms. Thank Hector. you. No questions. Thank you. Ms. Ford now. Okay. Ms. Nip, would you like to call another witness? <coughs> no. Okay. So, I'm any, any to close. testimony of your own? I'm, yeah, I'm prepared to give a closing statement. No, no, we're not oh, ready for closing. Oh, okay. Yet. I'm sorry. So, no. Okay. Mr. Bowersox. I'm going to, I am going to call Mrs. Nip in light of certain of the evidence that they have presented today for just a couple brief questions. Okay. Mrs. Nip, good morning. Um, I'm, I'm thinking you were sworn this morning with the other one. The letter that was introduced as exhibit number 12, was that, was that dated? Yes, the date is on the letter that okay. uh, Mr. Dixon has. Now, in that, there's some discussion about you wish Mrs. Boss would have come and had a conversation with you about her concerns. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Um, you sent the letter after the first day's hearing, correct? Correct. Right. And how many times did you reach out to Mrs. Boss or other neighbors before you applied or before the first hearing date to find out if there were any concerns and if so, what there were? I had never met Ms. Boss, um, so I did not reach out to her at all prior to starting the business. Okay. But as far as the other neighbors, the other surrounding neighbors, the four, actually five across the street who did not write a letter, but she has no problem with it, I talked to them numerous times and got their support before even considering. Okay. 
and you are still operating the outdoor part of your operation within the fenced area that we talked about a month ago? Yes, sir. Okay. I have no other questions from Mrs. Nip. Board members, questions of um, Ms. Nip's testimony? I have a question. How often are the dogs outside and how long? It depends on the weather. So the really hot days, they're only out there about 10 minutes at the top of each hour and then they come in and have indoor play area. Um, but if it's a beautiful day, we try to be out there as much as we can, um, but they're not running and playing the whole time. They're resting, which is why I provided a picture of them sleeping in the shade, and, but I'm out there all the time with them. <coughs> so we, we try to exercise them as much as possible. That's what people want me to do. Give them a tired puppy back. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I've I got a question just to clarify this. The letter to this uh, boss is 12. Yes. Now, this exhibit has got 11 and 12. Right? That was 11. This is 11. That was offered and admitted as 11, although it was marked as 12. So this is 11. That's what you told me. Mr. Simmons, any questions of Ms. Nipps' testimony? Well, then, see, the certificate of liability has 11, too. So, I've got two things that have the same number. Can you make one of them 11A? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll make certificate of liability 11A. Are you um, good? Are, are you, you have the, the legal house in order now? Okay, we're good now. So, <laughs> certificate of liability 11A. Without objection, Mr. Bowersox? Without objection. Okay. As long as I get a roster when we're done, so I know which okay. is which. Ms. Swisher. Am I permitted to ask several questions of Ms. Falls? She hasn't been called as a witness. She, she had, yeah, she hasn't been called as a witness. You can't. She okay. has, there's no testimony for you to ask okay. questions of. Okay, okay Mr. Bowersox, sir. We ready for summation? Um, I'm going to call Carla Boss. Uh, whether I do or not, or whether I, I am going to call her, I'm not sure that Ms. Swisher has any standing to cross-examine. And she doesn't. Okay. I mean, again, I'm trying to be polite, but I'm trying to protect the record. Um, she, yeah, okay. Mrs. Boss, you, will you, will you, could you identify yourself for the record, your name and address? Carla Boss, 7571 John Pickett Road, Woodbine, Maryland. Okay, what do you do for a living, Ms. Boss? Assistant store manager for Wise Markets. All right. And you live at that address. How long have you been there? 33 years. How, and do you own that property? We do. Um, and the corner of your lot lies across John Pickett Road, from the NIP property, correct? That is correct. Can you clearly see the NIP property from your home? We can. Okay. Um, have you since February been aware of Mrs. NIP operating some sort of a kennel type operation we have. on our property? We have. have you seen the dogs outside? We have. Okay. Can you hear the dogs? We can. Okay. So, how often are the dogs outside? Miss Nip usually starts at eight and they're out for four or five hours uh, which then they'll do their nap time and be back out there in the afternoon through the dinner hour. All right. You can hear the dogs? Most definitely. Is there any particular place on within the fenced in yard? And let me let me let me withdraw that question. When the dogs are outside, are they within the fenced-in yard that we saw in May 26 in the exhibits and we've heard about today? Yes. Okay. Um, how many at a time are out there? 
Uh, we've seen as many as nine um, at a time. Okay. So is there any particular part of the yard where they congregate or are they all over it? Or? Uh, it depends. Uh, lately, they've been more towards the middle of the lot and towards John Pickett. Um, but they do spend time wherever they're at on that lot, we can hear them. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the neighborhood. How would you describe the neighborhood? Uh, we're small homes, small lots, wonderful neighbors. Lived here for 33 years with no problems. Right. Residential? Residential. Single family? Single family. To the best of your knowledge, are there any commercial businesses in the immediate neighborhood? Not in the immediate neighborhood. And the nip lot, is it actually a little larger than, uh, say, your lot or other lots in the neighborhood? It is. All right. Has there been, to the best of your knowledge, a commercial business in the neighborhood in the 33 years you've owned your home? No. So you've heard, uh, you've heard the testimony from both days today in, in, on May 26th. What concerns do you have about the operation as proposed by Ms. <coughs> Nip? Well, first, that it's a commercial business in a residential neighborhood. Um, the noise, uh, we hear them, you know, like I said, no matter what part of the lot they're on, uh, we hear them. Uh, we're very concerned about the value of our property. We've spent 33 years investing in this as a home and as a property. And to have a commercial kennel within feet of your home, uh, simple little things that you take advantage of or you think you don't think of. We can't keep our windows open anymore because that's all we hear are the dogs barking. Um, and so our concerns are that we want to be able to retire in our home and we're both outdoor people. We have outdoor living areas. We spent 33 years building outdoor living areas. When I'm not at work, I'm either in my kitchen on the deck or in one of my living areas in my backyard, and it doesn't matter where I'm at, I can hear those dogs. All right. Um, do you have dogs? I do have a dog. All right, what kind of dog do you have? I have a pit bull mix. Okay. And you heard the testimony from May that Mrs. Nip has participated in a pit bull rescue in the past, although she says she's not uh, interested or planning to resume any uh, rescuing of those animals on her watch. Did you hear that? I did. Okay. Would it concern you if pit bulls were on the, the net property? It would. Why? Um, they are a dog that you do need to work with. Um, we rescued this dog because we have no children at home. And I have spent four years rehabilitating this dog. And they're just not a breed that, um, unless you're familiar with where they've come from as a puppy, that you can trust. Right? And so for me, it would be any rescue across the street would be a problem, but pit bulls in particular. They require a great deal of care? Very much a great deal. We have trainers. Um, we spent a lot of time with this dog. Okay. Um, so you, there was testimony at the prior hearing about a four by eight foot sign that was located on the fence, mm -hmm. um, visible from John Pickett Road. Is that correct? Lit and visible from John Pickett and Woodbine Road. Lit. All right. Is that still there? It is not. Okay. Um, you heard, let's, let's assume for a moment that somehow or another there's going to be some dogs in the yard at uh, Mrs. Nip's residence. You heard her testify that she has absolutely no plans to erect any noise mitigation landscape screening or a visual buffer. 
That is correct. Yes. And is the John Pickett side of her lot exposed? It is. All right. There's nothing there to do any of those things? No. Um, what are your concerns? Do you have any concerns about your property values? Absolutely. Um, and I'm just going to say it all started because we were working with the realtor who told us, you know, as close as that property is uh, within feet of your front door, that uh, an average of 10% we could be potentially losing on the value of our property, not to mention the hardship of selling the property as long as the active uh, commercial chemical is taking place. All right. Um, now, you've been there for 33 years. 33 years. Your boundary, as you know, it hasn't moved in 33 years, has no. it? How about the boundary of the NIP property? Has that moved in 33 years? No. All right. So, I'm going to ask you, um, from the fence, the screened-in fence that's closer to closest to your property, how far is that point from the corner of your lot that's the nearest corner? Feet. How many feet? I'm going to say far less than 100 feet. All right. It's certainly not 200, it's is it? not 200 feet. Okay. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? I have nothing further than anything else. Okay, Ms. Nip, do you have questions of Ms. Uh, Boss's testimony? Yes, I do. Okay. Ms. Boss, what steps did you take to reach out to me after you knew I opened the dog daycare and try to resolve? I wasn't trying to open a commercial kennel, so I made no steps to, to approach you. Why do you suppose that none of my immediate neighbors have complained about the dog? Objection. She that, can't. That's, she that, can't that's can't speculation. That, that's okay. Okay, that's fine. I know that we're all under oath, and I know that you just said that my dogs are out for hours barking. Um, mm -hmm. That's incorrect. Are you sure you want to stick Objection. With do you have a question? She's saying something that. Do you have a question? You, you, are, question. My, are my dogs barking constantly for four hours? <clears throat> they are not constantly for four hours. They're out for four hours and they bark sporadically for four hours on and off. When the UPS man comes, when the mail person comes, when somebody pulls in the driveway across from there, mm -hmm. when the joggers on the jog on the street reacting. And, and how do you know this if you cannot see my property that it's my dogs that you're hearing? and not two doors down that the dog's left out all day long or the house behind you where there's a dog that's left out all the time. Objection. The question assumes the truth of a matter that she did not testify to. So she testified that she can see it. Ms. Nip, questions of her testimony, okay? <clears throat> you discussed your pit bull. Mm -hmm. um, do you allow your pit bull to bark? My pit bull is never in my yard off a leash because we have wonderful new neighbors that have two dogs. And because I have a very dog aggressive dog, I, uh, we do not let our dog outside unless we walk the dog on a leash. So if he's barking, he's reacting to what he's hearing on the inside of my home to whatever is going on on the outside of my home. So you and I have a previous conversation and uh, it's my impression that you believe that dogs shouldn't bark. Is, is I'm going to check. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I'd ask you to rephrase, but I'm not sure how you could even rephrase yeah. that question. Yeah. Dogs are dogs, they bark. It's too good. <clears throat> and you, the hours that you testified that my dogs are outside, you are 
certain that that's when you see them and hear them. That is correct. Okay. Um, I have no further questions. Board members, questions of Ms. Boss's testimony? I have a question. Ms. Colwell. Um, question from Ms. Boss. Uh, it looks like there are five properties that, you know, that surround you. Mm -hmm. uh, how many yeah. have dogs? So uh, the, we share a fence line with two neighbors, and the neighbor directly across from the NIPS, we've always had dogs there. There's been two different owners. They have two dogs. And I never hear them barking. <laughs> I'm just going to say that. What about on the, if you're standing on your front door out on your right hand side? Uh, they've never had any pets. Uh, we do have some <coughs> new neighbors across the street that they say they have dogs, but I've never seen or heard those dogs. I was just concerned about the ones adjacent to you, physically adjacent to your yeah, property. They are very quiet dogs. And directly behind you? Uh, Nothing there's here. none behind us. None behind you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. No, I don't have any questions. Ms. Ford, now. So, Ms. Nip, you, I believe it's run Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. 8 to 5. You don't, but the weekends they have borders. Correct. Or do you run your business the entire seven days a week? I do. It depends. I own a beach condo, so we go a lot of, um, away on the weekends, and we go for a week at a time in the summer. So okay. I, I have a very flexible schedule. Um, so in I, that time, Ms. Boss, how often are you home if you have a job, and how often in those hours are you? So I have a pretty flexible job because I'm the hiring um, coordinator, okay. and so I definitely have my two days off. Mm -hmm. And sure. then I might put a six to eight hour day in, or if I can go home and do uh, work at home, then I'll do work at home. And, um, but you typically work Monday through Friday? No. Okay. No, I'm, my schedule is all over the place, so okay. I don't have a set schedule. Okay. If I may, the testimony from May 26th mm -hmm. was s 7 or 7.30 to 8 o'clock drop off, pick up beef around 7 ish in the evening seven days a week okay. now that was the testimony from may 26th okay and miss boss you tested you testified that you are working with a realtor are you in the process of selling your home no we um inquired when like everybody else sure. uh, when things picked up uh, for financial reasons thought okay could we or would we but we decided not to because we're not sure where a third child's going to land after okay. school and we don't want to move where I can't get to all three of them. Okay. So. Thank you. Any other questions of Ms. Boss's testimony? Can I ask two more questions? Okay. Um, Ms. Boss, is this the dog that you told me personally that you had the biggest problem with? I, I wouldn't know because there were so many of them there. Uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you which well, particular dog The reason I brought her today was. is because this dog was your biggest complaint. And we've been here how many hours. Well, that, that's not part of the case, so. All right. And then the last thing, did the house that um, sold directly behind me that connects with my property sell at a huge profit uh, several months ago? Objection. She, mm -hmm. she doesn't have that. personal knowledge of that, so she can't answer that. All right, I'm done. I'm assuming she doesn't. <clears throat> okay. Presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed. With your, indul me. with your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Um, in light of some of the questions, Mrs. Boss has brought a recording um, that she'd like to play. Uh, please bear with me, I'm sorry. Now, for purposes of covering some preliminary ground, did you record this? What were you going to play? I'm sorry, let's say that again. <laughs> did I you record this? this? Yes, and what did you record it on? So it's an app that you can download on your phone. Okay. And it just records. The noise. What is the app? Just so we know what it is. It is a noise meter, is what it's called. All right. And. Um, 
when was it recorded? Uh, so one of them was recorded on the 7th of May, and the other one was recorded just this past Saturday, uh, the day before Father's Day. Okay. And again, I apologize for that. And where were you when you recorded this? So this first recording uh, in May, uh, I was actually cleaning the windows in the front of my home. And, uh, inside or outside? I was on the outside. Um, but you, I set the phone down right on the window ledge. Um, so which, that's kind of an indication of what I hear uh, when they're on that outside on the lot. And have you enhanced these recordings in any way? You no, know, I barely can figure out how to get it to work sometimes. So I'm so sorry. I understand. There appears to be a number at the top of the screen. So it hit 78 and 90 at some point. Decibels? Decibels. And this goes on for the entire day. <laughs> and this is my bay window. Closely, you can even hear the direction given to the dogs because that's how close we are. Uh, where she's trying to calm the dogs or play with the dogs. This is May the seventh. This is May the seventh. So you heard enough of that one. How long does it go? Uh, well, this recording goes on for 20, 30 minutes. Well, is is what we heard representative? of the rest of the recording or are there any Absolutely. anything it gets different? louder as they get closer to the fence line it gets even louder okay. um, and is the june what did you say june 19. 19th is that any different uh, it's no different it's okay. the same i don't think this realizes that's what you hear okay Ms. Nip, do you have questions of the recording? I do. I heard birds in that. I heard a lot of other sounds. So how it's not accurate to record the sound of my dogs when she had it said it hit 78 decibels because I heard the birds louder than I heard my dogs. So that is not accurate. She's offering recording for what it is. She's not an acoustical engineer. Or experts, she's trying to give you some sense of what she's testified she hears regularly, and did for 20 minutes. When that's on May 7th, and apparently June 19th on a Saturday. And according to the decibel meter that's allowed, it, day is 65, and night is 55, and you do not hear my dogs at night. Okay. Presentation of testimony is now over? Yes. Presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed and summations are in order. The applicants first, then interested parties. Ms. Nip, summation comments? This is my closing? Yes. Statement. Okay, thank you. In closing today, I would like for you to know that many sounds and actions that go on in our non-private community neighborhood would have we have a horse arena that puts on weekend and holiday events in which hundreds of trucks and trailers go up and down the street, and they also have a PA system with announcements. Multiple neighbors have dogs that are left outside to bark all day. Roosters in the morning. We have someone that plays bagpipes. We have young gentlemen that drive up and down John Pickett um, for, they ride ATVs and gators and we have tractors on farms. There, uh, we also hear shots coming from guns because there is a shooting range behind us as well. Uh, we are in, not in a community neighborhood. We are surrounded by residential businesses and commercial businesses. Some businesses are run out of their home, some are zoned for commercial. As stated before, and it would be my pleasure to put into writing, <coughs> I do not plan to have more than 10 dogs on the premises at one time, that's including my four. I will not run any part of my boarding from the detached garage, 
and when I move, I would like to have my license void. It would be an injustice to my family, clients, and neighbors to have anything other than what I have just stated. I am asking you to please grant an approval to continue my well-received dog daycare and boarding business in the community. I have the support of all of my immediate neighbors, which have been proven by letters that have been read in the last hearing, and local business owners. Just a few fun facts on how our pups bring joy to the neighborhood. The children on the school buses look out and wave at the pups as they go past. There's a friendly competition between the mail carrier and the UPS man on who gives the better treats. I also watch the UPS man's dog. Neighbors bring their kids to the fence daily to see what pups I have for the day, and locals wave to us every time we're outside. There's a female jogger every morning that greets the dogs at the fence to say good morning. Lastly, since we opened, this business has donated funds to Einstein High School Athletic Department, sponsored and supported a children's entrepreneurship program, and helped with a student toward completing his service requirement hours for his school graduation. And we are about to take on a Boy Scout who needs his service hours as well. Thank you for your time and all of us who helped to get here today. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bowersox, some yes. Asian comments? Yes. Um, if you bear with me for just a second. Okay. Um, I'm going to start um, picking up where we left off in May, if, if I may. I'd like to focus on the variance. It's not Mr. worth talking about. Yes. Let's take a five minute break. If you yes. Okay. It's fine. Sorry for interrupting you there. It's okay. I feel like I'm at home. <laughs>
Bauer Sox summation comments. Thank you. Um, I've decided to move from the variance to the conditional use for openers. A conditional use is a use that is generally allowed, assuming you can satisfy all of the requirements of the zoning ordinance and not create adverse impacts at this location greater than they would be elsewhere in the zone. In this instance, you've literally heard and you've heard testimony about some of the noise that's emanating uh, from the NIP property. Now, the dogs bark? Yeah. We're talking about two, one, one and a half acre lots. They're all together in this neighborhood. These aren't larger ag or conservation zone tracks. The picket roadside of this property is wide open. There is some foliage along the back. I believe it would be the northern boundary line, but it's still visible. It's my understanding that there has recently been a pool constructed in the nip yard, which has resulted in the dogs favoring the nip side of the yard more than, excuse me, the boss side of the yard more than they had been previously. Nothing wrong with the pool. Um, we know that in this residential neighborhood, they've requested a commercial kennel. The undisputed testimony from May 26th was drop-offs beginning at 7 in the morning, running till about 8, and the pickups around 7 o'clock in the evening, seven days a week. The drop-offs and pickups occur on the John Pickett side of the road. <coughs> Mrs. Boss has indicated to you, she's articulated, I believe quite reasonably and with some basis, that she has concerns about the value of her property as a result of the operation of a kennel type facility on the property, on the NIP property, which she can see and hear. She has described the noise, and she's played the noise for you, as being characteristically different than the noise from the other neighbors' dogs they keep as pets. <clears throat> we know the dogs are let, are, are let outside often during the day. Is there anything wrong with that? No. But they're outside during the day in a portion of the yard facing John Pickett Road all day long. Not that they're out there all day long, but these, in, these events happen regularly throughout the day. One of the other things that's involved with this case, and, and it's really the heart of the matter, in order to meet all of the ordinance requirements for a conditional use at this location in the agricultural zone, she has to satisfy setbacks and minimum distance requirements that are imposed above the, the regular ag zone setbacks. They can't do it we submit that she can't get a variance from you for the variances on this record. The purpose of allowing the amendment in today's continuation was in response to my argument in May that you should dismiss the case now because 
there hasn't been an, a, any variance requested from one of the properties, my clients, which clearly needs a variance from the minimum distance requirement. That application was amended. And the pertinent parts of that amended application you have seen as Exhibit 7, upon its Exhibit 7. It demonstrates that there's a recognition of a need to satisfy various minimum distance requirements. The code provision providing for that is Section 158.040 distance requirements. When you look at the roster of uses, and we still have them in the Ag District because that hasn't been rewritten as a new code, you'll see that it is subject to the minimum distance requirements. That conditional use in the Ag Zone, subject to the minimum distance requirements of Section 158.040. Some uses, as you know, are subject to multiple times the distance requirement. The distance requirement is 200 feet. Specifically, that provision says any, and this is subsection A of 158.040, any uses or buildings subject to compliance with this section shall be located at least 200 feet from any lot in a residence district. Two is the important one for this case. Any lot of less than three acres in the A district, which Mrs. Boss's property is, occupied by a dwelling not located on the same lot as the said use or buildings. Clearly, this is a, this is a lot that is intended by that code provision to be within the protections of the compliance of 158.040. So where do we measure this 200 feet from? Mrs. Nip, through Mrs. Uh, Swisher, is telling you that we measure it from the house, okay? If the house is the locus of the use, that makes sense. There's been testimony, you've seen pictures, you've heard the recording, and it's not denied that an integral part of this operation that there's a request for legitimation through a conditional use approval form is conducted outdoors for some period of time during the day. Section 158.060 was the provision that the applicant was relying on that you only have to measure from the building. And in the case of a, a use that's a building, that makes sense. Later on, in the same statutory provision, it makes clear that where you have an outdoor use, such as we have here, and remember, section 158040, minimum distance requirements, any use or building. When there's an outdoor use, then you measure from the portion of the outdoor use nearest the lot deserving of the protection of the setback or the minimum distance requirement towards the closest corner of that neighboring lot. It's been admitted that that corner by the applicant is certainly less than 200 feet. You've heard from Mrs. Boss, it's probably less than 100 feet. So the Boss lot still is not included within those lots for which variances are requested by the amended application. Let's take it a step further. If we're measuring 
from that part of the outside, that part of the fenced area adjacent to Boss, the Boss lot's not that big. It's not that wide. It would appear from a, a glance at the platting that's been provided, at the, at the materials you've got in evidence, that perhaps the other neighbor to the north of the bosses is also within 200 feet. And so there may be multiple flaws in the initial variance request. You can't grant the relief requested on this application because they haven't re even requested appropriate variances. Secondly, let's assume the variance requested, variances requests were appropriate. Let's say they were appropriate. In order to obtain a variance in the state of Maryland, and those veterans, I'll say, I've heard this before, it's a two-part standard. The first is some, there has to be something unique about the property. Not just that I really like it because it's quirky and it's fun. Something unique, and it has to go to the essence of the property itself. The case law that's discussed this element has told us that what we're looking for are geological features, topography, environmental areas, that the presence of which make this property uniquely unable to satisfy the ordinance requirements with regard to the bulk requirements. That's not the case here. You've seen pictures of the yard. There was testimony on May 26. There's nothing peculiar about this yard. There's a gentle slope. You can see that in the photos. Testimony is it's a typical small lot residential neighborhood. Now, well, isn't that unique? No. Uniqueness does not include features that were brought about by the property owner or the property owner's predecessors in title, including lot sizes. I, I didn't make this up, but that's what we've got to apply here. So you have a substandard lot here. There can't be satisfaction of the uniqueness standard. Let's move on to the second standard which is either undue hardship or practical difficulty. There is some question, just as an aside, in the county code, and you've heard me, some of you have heard me argue this before, about which of those two standards applies. Is it undue hardship or is it practical difficulty? The definition section of your code that talks about what a variance is, is not, is not necessarily consistent <coughs> with the language giving the board authority to grant variances. And it can be read as judges of the Court of Special Appeals have read it in unreported opinions to say that the Carroll County standard is unwarranted hardship, not practical difficulty. Be that as it may, under either standard, these hardships cannot be of the applicant's own making or the applicant's predecessor entitled. Self-created hardship, even though, that sounds very harsh, I'll admit it. Mrs. Niff, I believe she wasn't familiar with this. If I didn't do what I do for a living, I wouldn't be familiar with this. But self-created hardship is not a personal criticism. It's the way to characterize what kind of inconveniences are we having with the property. Is it because of the dynamic of the property itself? Because I've got a huge rock face jutting out of a part of it? Or is it because I just don't have a big enough lot to do what I want to do? That's self-created hardship. And that's what the case law says. Mills versus Godlove, Mr. Dixon may be familiar with, tells us the general rule is that the authority to grant a variance should be exercised sparingly 
and only under exceptional circumstances. This is a case out of either Allegheny or Was it's Washington County uh, from 2002, I believe. Um, <clears throat> you, you bear with me. Where these, where these variance requests are primarily for the convenience of the applicant, that does not meet practical difficulty or undue hardship. Convenience is not the same as hardship. So that's essentially what we have here today. What is asserted as the hardship? The hardship, I, I, I asked Mrs. Nip that question twice on May 26th. Well, I couldn't run my business uh, and I couldn't pay my bills. That most of us would consider a hardship. That's not the hardship that the law establishes as a condition for a variance. So the perceived hardship, I'm not going to dispute if that's the case. But have they met the standard for a variance? No. Because of that, I'm going to say that you can't grant the variance that's required in order for them to meet the threshold requirements of the ordinance to establish this use of this location. And you've also heard testimony that this is likely to cause adverse impacts at this location that are different than they would be at other locations in the ag zone where you didn't have this kind of a neighborhood setting with a proximity of neighbors without um, with an open area directly across the street within a hundred feet perhaps from another residential site so we would ask that you deny the request for variance and conditional use. I'm going to say this, this is not to back away from my initial request. Should the board, um, and I, we're not suggesting you have a basis to do it, grant the variance and grant the use. You ought to consider, and again this is without waiving my prior argument, limitation of hours of operation and days of operation. No further pit bull rescue be conducted from the site. Limit the number of dogs that can be outside at one time. On the John Pickett Road side, and perhaps this can be done through a limited kind of site plan review and approval, some noise mitigation measure, some landscape screening of some sort, some visual buffer. There's none there. These are not unreasonable <clears throat> kind of features that one would see with any condition we use, particularly so with a kennel. The owner has indicated that she would consent to it being only for the period of her ownership and residence at the location. We think that would be a sound condition. Limit the number of dogs to just what's been requested, six, six in addition to the four that she has. The task garage not to be used as a county use. And that the owner consent to reasonable requests from zoning administration to an inspection for compliance purposes. Now, that's merely as an alternative, um, but we would, we would submit to you that the approval can't be granted for the reasons I mentioned. Thank you. Okay, presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed. Uh, the hearing and record of this case is closed.
And in accordance with the Open Meetings Act of Maryland, the board will now consider the case. Mr. Simmons. It's always fun to hear these cases. It's hard to know whether or not you're hearing something that has to do with a conditional use or a neighborhood dispute or conflicts that possibly could have been resolved through neighborly conversation. Um, I'm inclined to grant the conditional use uh, with the conditions as stipulated or suggested. Um, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, seven days a week with restrictions in terms of uh, Saturday and Sunday, but not limitations on Saturday and Sunday. People do travel, people do take vacations, and they include seven days a week. Uh, that, that's where I am right now. I'm always interested in my colleagues' opinions. Mr. Caldwell. Uh, I'd like to get uh, some clarification from uh, Mr. Dixon. Can I yeah. step out for a minute and ask him a question? Um, it, go, ahead, go ahead, Matt. You can ask him in open session here, I think. Uh, when did the applicant um, seek approval for the dog kennel? I can't remember from my, I don't have my copy of the record. <laughs> Was it before or after this? Was there an application made for a dog kennel? Or is it, was that afterwards when the uh, variance was sought? It was, it was made in April. The application was made in April. But it had been running since <coughs> February, right? Right. And it was because the zoning administrator knocked on the door. I guess maybe somebody complained and then then she came to the uh, somebody complained and the zoning administrator knocked on the door and then she filed an application to uh, correct it. Okay. Um. Now my view on this, I, I, I uh, support the original uh, situation where the, uh, the zoning administrator said no. So um, I'm going with uh, taking the offer of you. The zoning percent. administrator didn't say no. The zoning administrator said this, these are the steps you need to take in order right. to be in compliance. I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it should be approved for variance. Okay. The second. I think in this instance that the, uh, the smaller lot sizes in the neighborhood problematic for this use. Um, I would agree that there needs to be a variance from the <coughs> And I didn't hear any testimony from the applicant arguing their position as to why they meet the criteria for a variance with regard to practical difficulty or hardship. The recording was very compelling for me. And I just think overall, this does not meet the Schultz versus Britt standard at this location. I um, agree with Mr. Simmons. I think that it's hard to differentiate actual hardship versus um, maybe a neighborly conflict. Um, I understand that something should be put in place to make the situation better. I agree with um, noise buffering, um, possible limitation of hours, definitely not on the weekends though, because I feel like that's, so my vote would be in favor of um, Mrs. Smith. Hmm. <laughs> I went to Francis Guy Key High School. I'm not real good at math, but I understand two <laughs> plus two. And I'm five. Mm. 
This is a uh, very troubling case. Um, you have letters of support uh, from the neighbors that are in close proximity. You have a neighbor that's across the street, which is impacted as much as the neighbors that are uh, contiguous. I'm going to call them contiguous because there is a road uh, separating his boss's property from the SNPs property. Um, I get to hear a lot of sounds. I'm, I'm a farmer. I'm outside. I hear a lot of sounds all the time. I hear dogs. I've got neighbors that are over a half a mile away in each direction that have uh, Great Pyrenees dogs. And if Mr. Fox or Mr. Coyote is tantalizing them all night long, uh, the Great Pyrenees dogs are very vocal. Um, so I get to hear them. I hear them. It doesn't really annoy me. I, I hear them. The one thing that does wake me up in the morning is the birds. And I heard in Miss Boss's recording that the birds were as loud as what the dogs were. Um, maybe I'm just oblivious to noise. When we're looking at The argument here is the variance and with, whether Miss Boston, they need a, a variance from Miss Boss's um, residence. It goes to the fence. And I'm not sure where that fence fits in, whether that is part of the structure, whether it's not part of the structure. But I'm in, in favor of granting the variance to Miss Boss's property and the surrounding properties. And, but again, I think there's some mitigation things that, efforts that need to be carried out. And I think screening is one of them. Um, a limit of hours of operation, um, it was testified seven to seven seven days a week, I think is what was testified to in, um, in, in, in our first part of the hearing. And I, I think that um, some of the normal activities that, that occur, whether it's joggers going up and down the road or the UPS guy, the post office guy that shows up, um, the dog showing up, if, if a guy's showing up and he's going to be feeding the dogs, they get conditioned to that, and they're going to yelp. Um, so some of the some of the <coughs> issues with the noise um, is in, is inevitable. Again, I'm I'm in support of this, but I think there needs to be some restrictions put on. I think Mr. Bowersox outlined uh, some very good points uh, to um, mitigate what's going on uh, at this location. Mr. Bill. <clears throat> you indicated that you were in favor of granting the request for the variance from Mrs. Boss. There was no and, and, and all and all the other. There was no request for that, and the ordinance speaks to outdoor area. No. Jay, can can we ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> Did, were you sworn in? No, he was sworn in. Hmm. Okay, we'll swear you in. Can you please stand and raise your right hand? <coughs> this is very unusual that during our deliberations we have this happening. Um, where's my cheat sheet? Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay. Mr. Voigt, is the fence part of the structure, or is that excluded from the structure? The new code says it's excluded. The, the codes, there's two um, references in the code. Uh, one does refer to the structure that the use is in, which would be the house. And there's also another section in the same section of the code that refers to space being used um, outside of the house. If the yard is being used outside of the house, I would say that would 
include the whole yard, not necessarily just a designated section. So I would say to the fence line, to the property line would be where you would have to measure from. So to the property line, not to where the well, actual fence is? Generally, fences are at property lines. Um, but if the fence is in a smaller area of the lot than the whole lot, then I would say from the fence. So if the fence was moved in this case, could that mitigate the need for uh, a variance from Ms. Boss's property? Uh, that, I, without measuring and, and looking at it, I could not answer. But if it, if it was moved and it was at 200 feet from Ms. Boss's property, if the fence was moved to there, if that was the limit to the use of that property, the use of that area, that's where I would measure from. Would be from the fence. Sorry to throw more mud in the water. If I, if I may, and I know this is unusual, but just the liberation. Yeah, yeah, we, it, it, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, you have a right to speak. You have a right to speak. None of you have a right to speak. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, that, it, it's. So we, he doesn't need the, uh, if I'm, Go ahead. If I'm Go understanding ahead. Mr. Boyd right correctly, they, the criteria has not been met based on the presentation. The outdoor area is being used. It's within 200 feet. So the, the variance, <coughs> a variance is required from that lot if they have not requested it. So what you're suggesting is we start jumping through, I feel like all kinds of hoops to accommodate this when they haven't requested it. And the amended application didn't request it. So this says the commercial kennel, a lot size variance and three distance variances. Is that not the same thing? But it's, it's more than three distance variances. So I don't think we, I think we're back in a quandary similar to what we had before. I don't see how we can legally grant this. Are you looking at the comments? Mr. Simmons? Nothing. Any, any comment? No. Mr. Caldwell? I didn't meet the criteria for there. And they haven't requested that variance. Yeah, I jumped the fence, guys. <clears throat> right before you try to play. <laughs> Very true. That's a that's, that's a that's a pretty good trick. It wasn't requested. That's that's the problem. We can't. We need to act on what the application is, and the application did not. Include that. You you have the new one, the new application. Mm -hmm. You're looking at the new one. Yes. <clears throat> There's the table. Okay, board members, motion. In case 6322, I move that we deny the request for conditional use for commercial kennel, a lot size variance, and three distance variances. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion to deny the application. Any further discussion on the motion? Plexiglass has really silenced everybody. Okay. We have a motion to deny. All those in favor of the motion to deny say aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Nay. Three to two three to two decision to deny the application. 
Our oral decision will become final upon written decision, which will be issued within 30 days unless otherwise extended by the board. The board's decision may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the clerk of the circuit court for Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of this board's written decision. Thank you very much. Thank you.